This is a Dreamcast disc and is for use only on a Dreamcast unit. Playing this disc on a hi-fi or other audio equipment can cause serious damage to its speakers. Dreamcast, up to six billion players. Welcome back to the stage of history. Why don't we play together? Hey, 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 it's time to make some crazy money. Are you ready? Here we go! Please stop this disc now. Now, 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 now. Hello and welcome to another episode of DreamPod, the podcast by Dreamcast Junkyard. I'm Andrew and today I am joined by one, two, three people. Hello, three people. Um, the first of which uh, is Mike. Hi, Mike. How are you? Hello, Andrew. Yes, I am the first person and um, I am well. Thank you. Good. Uh, second person is Lewis. How's it going, Lewis? Uh, yeah, I'm not so bad. Thanks for having me on. Well, thank you. Um, I don't know how to respond to that. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> and uh, last but not least, the third person um, out of four of us um, is Rob. Uh, back again. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Andrew. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, and thanks for letting me come back on again. Awesome to have you on. Uh, like we said in the, the Dreamcast mini episode, uh, happy to have you on whenever, really. Um, so thanks for coming back. And yeah, we have uh, another themed episode for you this time. Um, and we're going to discuss, as you've probably seen, if you've kind of looked at the name of the podcast before you've listened to it, as most people tend to do, you will know that we're doing a Left in Japan special, uh, all about the games that came out in Japan, but never made it over here. Uh, and the ones that we'd really like to see, hopefully at some point, make it over if we could wave a magic wand, I suppose. But before that, I'm going to go with tradition for a change, which is not like me. And I'm going to go around and ask uh, what people are playing at the moment and if they've had any recent Dreamcast pickups. Um, so I'm going to start with Lewis. Uh, Lewis, have you got anything to tell us? Uh, I do not have any recent Dreamcast pickups, although mm. maybe just to fill in here, I, I can remember I, there was one I didn't mention on the last podcast where we talked about pickups, and that was actually that I picked up uh what's shen mu so i, I yeah. picked that one up which is something i've always been intrigued to play what with the uh, suppose law on the internet about this, this like weird demo you know sort of a a strange demo that really you probably wouldn't see again you know it was so unique at which i suppose you know sums up shen mu in a nutshell really i'm gonna get a guide and i'm gonna play it and it's gonna be really fun and i'll look forward to the weird ending involving the uh, head of Sega at the time with all the dream casts that he can't sell. Yeah, it's <laughs> going to be a good one. That was quite, um, yeah, that's quite funny. Um, have you been playing anything besides not playing what's shown me yet? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the um, I've been st sort of stuck in this like backlog that I'm just trying to clear out. So I'm nearly finished. Uh, I've nearly finished Persona 5 Royal. Um, which is amazing, you know, play it if you haven't played Persona 5. But I did pick up a few new games, you know, ready for when, uh, you know, I finished that. I got uh, 13 Sentinels, Aegis Rim, which is this weird vanillaware tactical RPG story-based game. I kind of don't really know what it is, and I don't think anyone knows really how to describe it because it seems like a very specific game I, I remember actually seeing an advertisement for it on twitter from sega and they basically tr were tr the advertisement was based around this is what this game is you know we're trying to explain it to <laughs> i think it must be like a really japanese concept but it seems to be some kind of mech um tactical game with a lot of uh, you know really good story elements and because it's vanilla where um, if anyone has played uh, dragon's crown or um, odin's sphere they're known for having really beautiful um, like sprite work or artwork um, so it's got all of that in it it looks great mm -hmm. and then the other one i i bought um, one i've uh, always wanted to get but never never got and that's uh, Tales of Berseria. Um, everyone says that this game is really good, but I've never played it, and so I'm gonna give it a try. Yep. Awesome. Sounds good. Um, cool. 
Mike, what about you? Have you is, uh, do you have anything left to pick up for the Dreamcast at this point? What if... Yeah. Yes, lots lots of stuff to pick up because okay. I'm strange and buy random things. <laughs> True. Um, <laughs> uh, have I picked anything up? I think I've picked up since the last podcast. I don't think we did a uh, I don't think we did a round the table talk last time. So um, I picked up some magazines, some more magazines. I've now got 190 Japanese Dreamcast magazines. Wow. Um, and I've picked up a couple of random bits. Uh, I think the last PAL accessory I needed was a SCART cable in box. I picked that up. Um, so not nothing particularly amazing. Um, also, I've got the the new indie games coming very soon, mm-hmm. um, and I am currently playing through the third release candidate and pretty much the final version of Xenocider um, oh. because I'm part of the, uh, the quite pre-ordered it, so I've, I've got the the beta. But uh, yeah, really really good at that. Um, but in terms of playing other things, so I've done a bit of rally gaming for the other podcast that me and Tom appear on. Mm-hmm. Um, we've done some uh, WRC nine came out uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, so yep. for power for power drift in our, our podcast, we've I've played been been playing that quite a bit. I've also been playing uh, Tony Hawk's one and two remastered, and I've also been playing uh, Mafia Definitive Edition, uh, oh. which is fantastic. Uh, I've been playing that a lot this week. Nice, nice. That does look good. I, I kind of really want to get the Mafia remastered trilogy because I always really like two. And it yeah. looks like they've kind of upgraded the graphics a bit for that, which yeah, is nice. Yeah, two's, two's fantastic. Two's one of my favorite games uh, of all yeah. time. I, I got the I got the trilogy pack, and mm-hmm. um, number three was was pretty poor, unfortunately. It was a not very good game, yeah. but number two is really, really good. Number one, I think a lot of people who played on Xbox originally for the original Mafia um, or PS2 probably didn't expect. I know I know the game's a different game; it's a, it's a remastered game, but it's much closer to what or the PC version originally was much closer to the open world that this game is. Mm-hmm. And I played it on the PC originally, so it's um, it's really a game, really good uh, graphics, and also just a really good, well implemented story, which I think is um, not many open world games really manage to get the story down. I think mm. Rockstar do. Rockstar always seem to get the story elements done really well, and uh, um, Mafia is similar to, to Rockstar in that in that uh, respect. They've got the the storyline properly down. Mafia Two's got a fantastic story anyway. But Mafia One or Definitive Edition. Um, also fantastic story mm. sounds like we have to pick this up at some point really mm. good um it's a shame that three isn't so great though but you know yeah. it's in there i guess so you play it at some point maybe um cool rob what about you what have you picked anything dreamcast related up or are you what are you playing at the moment no i'm afraid i haven't picked anything up dreamcast wise um so can't really add anything in there in terms of what i'm playing um i finished off um ghost of tsushima which um I reviewed for T3 and then, you know, I played it all the way through and then I've been sort of doing all the extra sort of collectible stuff, you know, the sort of, uh, I always think of Assassin's Creed, you mm. know, that level of sort of like, oh, you finished the game, have you? No, you haven't. You've got <laughs> to go and collect X, Y and Z and, you know, you've got to do these extra little bits. So I've been doing that. Um, and then I've just actually run through Dishonored 2 again. Um, I absolutely love Dishonored and Dishonored 2, the second one especially. I'm a huge fan of The Count of Monte Cristo, um, which is obviously what those games were based on. And um, the second one is just fantastic. So I've just done a no powers run through with Emily on a quite hard difficulty setting. But it was sort of maximum carnage. Um, So there was no sort of stealth or anything. It was just you know just uh, ripping through everybody so that was that was a good laugh how about you andrew what have you been uh, picking up slash playing um well i can't remember if well, the last time that i actually did this because if i'm on i'm usually hosting and therefore i don't <laughs> I don't do this i think the last thing i picked at dreamcast related was um so i've got a couple of friends who live up in liverpool um from the cross players and they happen to be good i think this is a good few weeks ago before the local lockdowns came back into effect and they kind of gone out and they went to this uh, retro store um, and there was so many Dreamcast games there and there was some white label stuff there which you don't generally tend to see very much in um, in game stores um, so and he showed me what they had and it was Echo the Dolphin and Soul Calibur white label mm-hmm. so it's like yeah I might as well get it so I got those and 
he sent them over to me. I've sent Soul Calibur off to my, my nephew because I got him a Dreamcast for his birthday this year. Um, he was like 11, I think. And uh, I think that's like a good age to get him into Dreamcast. <laughs> and he's been kind of interested in the book uh, that I've done and everything like that. So he, uh, yeah, there's another game to add to his collection for the Dreamcast, which is good. Um, he's quite into Tekken as well. So I thought that Soul Calibur would be a, an interesting, uh, different fighting game for him to try. Um, and Echo the Dolphin, which I haven't played yet, but I, it was one of the games that I've not really got on, on that well with in the past. But for a fiver and the white label version, I thought, yeah, I'll give it I'll give it another shot um, once I get my Dreamcast plugged back into the TV. Um, so that's that's kind of all I've picked up, really, in terms of Dreamcast stuff playing wise. Um, so I've been playing Resident Evil 7 which is a pretty old game at this point, of course, but we're in October uh, as we record this. Um, and so Halloween, I thought I'd play a scary game um, and I'm further than I got. So I originally got, got it with the intention of playing through the entire thing via VR. Um, I get incredibly motion sick and I could only do it in 20 minute bursts. So I think I got two hours in <laughs> doing it in 20 minute bursts mm-hmm. um, and had to stop because um, I got to it. I think I got to a boss fight that was just beyond me. Uh, it, it's like 10 tries and I still couldn't manage it. Uh, I've now breezed past that. I've, I've completely, you know, I've, I'm not playing it in VR now. I'm just playing it normally and got past it. And I'm a good hour to an hour and a half past that point now. So, uh, yeah, I feel like I'm getting somewhere with it. And my hope is that I can finish it uh, by the time Halloween proper gets here. So the 31st, I'm hoping. Um really enjoying it like i'm a you know as people might know i'm a huge resident evil fan so i'm quite ashamed that i haven't finished this game yet considering it's a big game in the series so i'm yeah i'm very excited to get further in it it's very very interesting i'm I'm kind of very interested in the lore of this game and what the story where the story is going to end up because everything's still a little bit mysterious at this point um and the the antagonists are absolutely insane um the, the the screaming that marguerite does as she chases you through the house uh the things the name she calls you is terrifying but yeah it's it's great um other than that the only other game i've been playing and i don't know if any of you guys have played this but it's a title that is only just recently come to the public consciousness i think and that's something called among us it's, it's worthwhile i mean it's free if you get it on mobile i mean it's, it has ads because it's you know a mobile game but y- you can pay to turn them off but it, it's essentially kind of werewolves slash mafia not the mafia you're playing but like the game that you play where you have to shut your eyes and you're in a circle in real life you know when we could all meet up before everything happened um and you can shut your eyes and uh, some, you, you choose somebody to kill it's essentially kind of like that but in video game form so you are uh, kind of like little weird creatures on a spaceship and you'll have to run around fixing the spaceship doing li- your tasks but one of the people among you among us uh, is an imposter and is actually trying to sabotage the ship and kill you all and you spend the whole game basically if you're the imposter going around sabotaging things and picking off people one by one and everybody else has to figure out who it is and throw them off the ship and you can only talk when you have meetings so when you find a body or when you press the big red button in the center table in the in the spaceship um you can only talk then and discuss amongst yourselves who you think is the imposter it is incredibly good fun if you're playing it with friends and i've discovered that i am actually quite a good liar um (laughs) and i've talked myself out of being chucked out of the airlock a number of times while being the imposter um yeah uh, i think one of my oldest friends steve who i do dcy with uh he he, on a couple of occasions he's used our 20-year friendship as his kind of get out of jail free card like you know you can trust me we've been friends for 20 years and he was being genuine with it so i was uh, i was mean and i i used it back on him while i was the imposter i was like we've been friends for 20 years steve don't throw me out the airlock you can't you can't do this and he he saved me and i was the imposter and i felt very bad about it but i won so uh, yeah, that game brings out a, a, a bad side of me, I think. Um, <laughs> but I definitely say play it if you haven't played it. It's incredibly fun. And for a free game, you know, it's worthwhile. Cool. OK, uh, so that's pickups and what we're playing. Awesome. Uh, next time, I promise I'll go back and, and I'll, I'll think of a, a, a really weird question just to throw you all off. So don't worry. Um, I'll go back to normal next time. So. As we mentioned at the beginning, uh, this is a Left in Japan special. Um, And this is one that I know, Lewis, you were very keen on because you're such a huge fan of Japanese games um, and just weird, obscure titles, right? Yeah, I I like to try anyway. Not that I can play most of them because I'm lazy and don't put in (laughs) the effort. But yeah, if it's weird, if it's Japanese, 
and I don't understand it. I want to understand it, basically. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's fair. And we kind of put a tweet out about this. And uh, Rob, that's how you kind of realised we were going to make this episode. And, and this is also your jam. So that's why you're here, right? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it, guys. I mean, like, um, the, one of the main reasons, you know, back in the day that I really got into Dreamcast was Japanese exclusives and imports. And I don't have a massive collection now. But yeah, I was all up for this, for sure. Definitely. And Mike, we know you, you pretty much like any Dreamcast game because you've bought them all. So, you know, you've yes. got a great knowledge. <laughs> stick, a, stick a swirl in it, I'll buy it. <laughs> oh, that's a good business plan, actually. Anybody yeah. listening out there, put a swirl yeah. on it, Mike will buy it. Whatever it is, it's fine. Other than Sega, of course, but that's another topic oh. for this podcast. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very true. Very true. Um, but yeah, you, you do have, as as Lewis uh, said, uh, has said many a time, you have an encyclopedic knowledge of, of Dreamcast games in general. So uh, you're kind of almost the perfect person to have with us as we uh, take this journey uh, through Japanese games that have been left in Japan, essentially. The games that we're talking about haven't come to the West at all. This is going to be an interesting one. Um my personal experience is I don't have a huge amount of experience with Japanese titles beyond big ones like, uh, actually, no, I won't say because it'll spoil it for later. But, you know, there's there's some games out there that I've, uh, I, well, one that we're probably not going to discuss, which doesn't need translation, to be fair, is Cosmic Smash that never came out here yep. in the West. Great game. Yep. Um, yeah. And Cool Cool Tune as well, which I got because mm -hmm. I loved Space Channel 5 so much that I bought that. And you don't really need any translation to understand what's going on there. But um, so, yeah, that's kind of that's my only real my, my knowledge of Japanese games is the stuff that were, were, were fun, but didn't really need much in the way of translation to play. Um, so what we'll do is we will go around in a bit of a circle and uh, discuss, really. Uh, we've each picked two games, so I'm going to come to each of us in turn uh, we'll do one game each and then we'll go back around again um the person whose game it is will kind of have a bit of a, a description about what the game is and what they like about it and then we'll just have a general discussion uh and we've got some extra ones at the end that we can talk about as a group um so i guess the best place to start is probably with encyclopedia mike um <laughs> and one of the games that we've uh, that you're gonna and i'm gonna absolutely butcher the name and you can correct me as soon as I've said it, is Sushin Tyson Logic Battle Day Session. That's, that's how I would say it. Okay, awesome. I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think I, I don't think Encyclopedic Mike is necessarily um, correct Japanese pronunciation, Mike. No, we have Martin and, and Ross for that, right? Um, that's a separate thing. Um, okay, cool. So what is this game then? So I think it's, it's very difficult to describe the game um without sort of referring to other things okay. and the only way of really describing the game is to call it battleships now okay. it's not battleships there are no ships uh, involved but it's a very similar sort of style of play so basically you have a grid um for yourself and a grid for your opponent um, and then you put uh, your soldiers on the grid in various different formations um, you basically pick between uh, one, two, three, and four um, soldier formations. You can pick them onto the onto the uh, grid you have, and you have a certain amount of points you can basically spend uh, on putting those figures onto your map. Um, your opponent is the same, uh, without you knowing, and your basic aim is to then uh, bomb the other side without seeing what's actually going on. And if you get a hit, you can carry on as uh, as as normal. So it's basically battleships. It's probably more akin to battleships, some of those weird electronic battleships variations you got on some of the electronics battleships board games. I don't know if anyone else had that as a kid, but I had a, mm. a sort of electronic battleships and there was loads of variations you could do. Um, so it's similar to that to an extent. Um, it's all quite cutesy anime characters. It's all a little bit weird. I'm not really sure what's going on. It's quite bright and colourful. Um, there's sort of little characters on an island. Uh, I'm not quite sure why the island's at war. I'm guessing some kind of, you know, inter fairy warfare is going on. I don't I don't know. I honestly don't I haven't got a clue. Um but the game actually plays quite well. It's quite easy. There's a multiplayer mode as well, which is actually really playable. And it's just one of those games where when I was going through the, the A to Z guide, I had to play through all of the, the Japanese puzzle games. And some of them are really, really easy to get into. Um, some of them not quite so much. And this one was one where I, I really didn't expect much. And it actually was far better than I thought. And I, it's a game that I've gone back to several times since. 
uh, which is unusual for for some of the puzzle games on the on Dreamcast because some of them haven't really aged as well as maybe they should do. So it, it's a, it's a fun, bright, colourful battleship style game, um, which is is I think I, I don't think I've seen anyone talk about it on the internet before. To answer. Hmm. Interesting. Um, I mean, so one of the reasons we're talking about um, Japanese games in particular, and these ones, well, th- there must be a reason that it was that it was left in Japan, as it were, that it hmm. never came out here. Is there any particular reason that you can think of that this just didn't come to the West? Is it just too Japanese, perhaps, for Western audiences? I think it's battleships. I think that's probably the reason why it didn't come to the West. Um, ah. Well, I, th- I, don't, I don't think in terms of the fact it's, it's a bit basic, isn't it? It's quite a basic game, I think. Right. Especially with the Dreamcast, I think you know there, there was already a bit of a a version to two D gaming at the time in the West. Um, mm-hmm. I you know I still remember some of those review scores in the Dreamcast magazines in the UK um, for you know some of the fighters and some of the shooters. Um, so I think that was possibly one of the reasons. I don't necessarily think it was it would suit a Western audience massively well. It's it's very Japanese in its style. It's very very cutesy characters very bright which is great in some occasions but i think it's just a bit too it's a bit too out there for for a a puzzle game um like this and a puzzle game which has battleships the the one the one reason this game is different than some of the other puzzle games is that there is a a fair amount of text in the game there's not there's not a massive amount of text in terms of you can't play it it's very playable but there's a story there. There's lots of other things. So I think the amount of time it would have to involve to translate it, I don't think it would have actually given um, the developer any sort of profit back at all. Um, it's yeah. developed by 45, who had a couple other games on the Dreamcast, who I won't mention in case they get mentioned later on. Okay. Um, but yeah, there's there's well-known developer. Um, I don't. I just don't think it would have necessarily suited. The Dreamcast. I think maybe the PS1 budget title. It may have been released as the PS1 budget title for all I know. I don't mm. think it was. Um, but yes, yeah, it's, it's that sort of thing where it's got a cheap. Again, I say cheap. I'm making it sound making a game sound awful. <laughs> cheap as in it's not a kind of game which would be, um, you know, fly off the shelves in the UK. Sure, it, yeah. it would cost more to you yeah know, to to sort out and put it into English language than it would probably make mm. back. Is what you said. I think so. Yeah, yeah. But it's it's. Yeah. It's really cheap as well. No, one great thing about these games, these puzzle games, is that they're not shooters. And Japanese Dreamcast games that aren't shooters um, or some fighters tend to be quite cheap. So this game is still pretty cheap to pick up. Um, so it's definitely worth uh, worth doing. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I get what you mean. I, I, yeah, it's not cheap, but it's. You could get. You, you got two two games you could buy in in the in the in the store, and you've got I don't know Soul Calibur or this. You know, yeah. most people back then are gonna go for the you know cutting edge 3d graphics or, whereas or even just, yeah. even even puyo puyo or or mr jilla you know i mean they're, yeah. they're more more well, well-known brands for for a, a but for a relatively obscure title uh, with no sort of you know, marketing behind it no sort of not marketing no sort of uh, name behind it it's it's would have been a pretty impossible sale i think and also the i've i've what i've looked at some gameplay actually i think i might mm. pick it up actually because it does sound really cool but like, there's a lot of like anime kind of graphics going on, and yes. mm. I mean, if you look, it's everyone who listening to, is listening to this, look at the cover art. It's basically like these two, I suppose, uh, what's the word? Like chibi, like really young looking girls, yeah. and it's like no one with is gonna ears. pick <laughs> with cat <laughs> ears. Yeah, it's very, very Japanese, very anime. When I was in high school. No one liked anime, and no. I can't imagine anyone liked anime in exactly. the West <laughs> when this game came no. out. It, it, yeah, hard sell. So unless they were to do like that kind of annoying thing that they did with a lot of games, like uh, Gunbird One or something, where they like give it a ridiculous facelift, make it about like battleships, maybe. But yeah, yeah. it's uh, definitely a hard sell back then. It would have been, wouldn't it? If it was released in the West, it would have had some kind of like weird soldier guy on the front of it, sort of. With some kind of nuclear explosion going off outside of you know Dagenham or something, it's that sort of. There's no. I understand that the, that the aversion some people have, mainly had rather than have, but um, towards these overtly Japanese titles, it was it is a bit of a weird culture shock for some people. Mm-hmm. But I mean, it's just some of the times we get the Western versions of stuff. They're so they're so oh, anemic of personality. Um, I think these kind of games, although they wouldn't have sold particularly well, I think we would have actually been talking about them. Um, 
now still as Dreamcast podcast because of the fact it was been so interesting and so different for us to play. I think that if this game came out nowadays, you know, if an indie studio released a game like this, hmm. it'd be kind of like a, a sleeper hit or something. It'd be like, oh, this is a game you should have played. You know, this was actually pretty good, you know. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I did think with that, and I think it was quite a lot of sort of like these, um, I don't know how you describe them, but like, yeah, smaller, sort of more casual games. Like, I think of a lot of stuff on Saturn and Dreamcast, like I've got a fair few like pool games, you know, yep. and the stuff that you now play on your mobile phone. And I think, the you know, back then, like a full-scale release, it, it, it's it's almost like in the wrong time. Like, yep. if you, I swear, like if you just pushed a lot of these games out, like you've just said... Like with e stores now on basically every console, you think about all the like the the third party sort of like light titles that you even got like the Nintendo Switch e store and obviously on mobile phones. I think yeah, you're right. I think it would have probably have got a lot more interest than it did back in the day. Yeah, I think it's, it is. It is a really weird. Um, it's a weird game, but it's a game which definitely I don't want to be lost to history. Uh, it's one of those games where it's, no one's going to know about it if people don't actually. Uh, keep playing it at some point one thing i will mention because uh, I, I just looked it up now because i forgot um there actually is a another version of the game um which is actually uh, one of the hello kitty games on dreamcast yeah. hello kitty garden panic which i think came with the consoles and itself um it's basically a hello kitty rebranded version of the game uh, which is is quite oh, interesting that is interesting yeah okay so, so mike you're saying that comes with the 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 gorgeous Hello Kitty console that everyone secretly wants. It, it, it does indeed come, I believe it comes with the, the, the Dreamcast Hello Kitty consoles, which I have, uh, but neither of mine have uh, ah. the, the discs with them, so I don't, I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just, um, obviously I know we've done this game, we've spoken a lot about this game, but like, maybe you could have maybe released it back then, Hello Kitty branding, might have, might have been interesting, but Another know. another year, I think another year of Dreamcast, we would have had these kind of titles coming through. I think uh, because when it ended, I think it was to an extent one of the reasons Dreamcast's popularity is so good is that we had quite a, quite a few um, big name games. We didn't have quite so much of the of the filler mm -hmm. um, for the sheer fact we wasn't the Dreamcast library wasn't around that much in the West, so we didn't have as much filler. So I think maybe yeah, it would have come maybe a year, two years later. Interesting. Yeah, that's been good. And it, I, I watched the video in advance of, of obviously it's recording this and it did look like it's the it's the most Japanese game I think that you could possibly ever, you know, that the anime <laughs> characters and everything is just it's completely out there, but it looks like a game that I would very much like to play. So I may also have to track this down. Um cool. For those listening who want to also track this down, that is Tsushin Tyson Logic Battle Dicesson, I think. Um, that's, a that's a price of the game gone up. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, let's keep an eye on that. Uh, <laughs> the Dreamcast dream the... don't get out of effect. Let's have a look. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, yeah I've just seen like, loads of people like, listening to this. They're going straight to eBay or their auction yeah. house of choice. It'll be this, like 150 quid or something. And you're like, damn yeah. you, junkyard. Damn you. <laughs> so, some scalper somewhere just like looks at his shelf. He's like, oh, I've got that one. <laughs> yep. Straight yeah. on eBay. Well, let's see if uh, the next game is going to make it onto that <laughs> list as well. Um, so the next game we're talking about, Lewis, this is one of yours. Yeah. Um, and this is Princess Maker Collection, which I think collects Princess Maker 2 and 3. Is that right? Yes. Um, really, though, I think uh, most people remember Princess Maker 2. I, I think um, Princess Maker 3 is not as uh, love beloved um, sort of, I suppose, nowadays you know when people talk about this uh, this series which um it, these are ports of msx games i think they're also on the saturn i think they're on all consoles i think they're on the super nintendo at some point as well and this is the collection that was put you know on the dreamcast in japan yeah um uh, so the first we, we started off light we're going straight in this is a game where you raise a child, basically. <laughs> has a very heavy medieval Europe vibe to it. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, mixed with 2D anime artwork. It's very kind of... I think I think we've discussed before, Mike, that quite often people lazily just call anything that would seem like this as just visual novel. Yes. Don't think it really is a visual novel, but it kind of has not. elements of it. <laughs> yeah, it's more of a, like a time management 
um, sim. So basically, the the plot is you're this famous warrior who is visited one day by a god who says that they need to raise a child of the heavens from of age 10 to 18 like you do like you know <laughs> only natural um and so you, you you basically manage the schedule of this child as she grows older um you manage stuff like part-time jobs schooling um their free time um there's an adventure mode as well which functions as like a turn-based RPG, so you actually move her around like a map and and uh, you know attack enemies, and um, with the outcome being that you want her to have the best possible job. So basically, how well you've done is based on the the job she gets at the end by at 18. When I was researching about this, I found that the game has 74 possible endings wow. um, based on how well you do, um, and there's like ridiculous endings she can be like an absolute upstanding citizen in society or if you're really shit she can basically rack up too much sin and become the demon queen of darkness just like <laughs> real life obviously... just like yeah, real life just oh, like yeah. how how people turn out in real life um obviously uh you want to make her happy cuz that <laughs> That one's considered a bad ending, believe it or not. I think the the closest thing on the Dreamcast to this is the Chows in Sonic Adventure 1 and 2, or even maybe The Sims later on, you know, managing people's lives and, you yeah. know, what they do and, and how it kind of feeds the, into their aspirations and who killers. they become. Giant, Giant killers. Giant killers. Yeah. It's, okay. basically, it's basically Football Manager with Japanese princesses. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> That's basically what it is. <laughs> But yeah, it's just, it, it, it really it's really interesting just how you know everything you do feeds into these stats that are just constantly at work in the background in the game, and like it's quite intense from the sounds of it as well because she can the the, the princess that you're raising can become stressed and even die if you don't do your job properly. So yeah, um, yes, yeah, very stressful, and it kind of makes me wonder who wants to play a childcare simulator is what i'm asking <laughs> mm. you know who wants to escape the stresses of you know their their job their nine to five and come home maybe have kids as well and then play this that's my question let, let me introduce you to the internet lewis um <laughs> i think you'll find there's lots of weird people online <laughs> mm, yeah um, I mean, why didn't this come out here then? Why? <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> why did this not come here? If there's so many weird people, um, I mean, it's 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 uh, it's innately Japanese, right? It's 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 very much a Japanese culture thing, is it not? The, the this kind of this kind of game, it's it, it's inherently Japanese. I would I would say. It displays a, it displays a, a naivety which I don't think the West has, does it really? Mm. Um, I think we sort of look at these games as being. Uh, rightfully or wrongfully, uh, quite pervy. And I don't think they yeah. are. They're not. And I think the no. problem is, is that that's it's a very it's a different sort of culture. Uh, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't have, have uh, worked as a retail release. I, I'm pretty sure they've got, and I'm sure Lewis will be able to correct me if I'm wrong. But I'm pretty sure there is um, English translated versions of the older titles. Yeah. So um, they're actually on Steam now. So this was actually yeah. how I found it out because someone, I think it was. A year or so ago, they reviewed this, and uh, I was like, "Oh, that's what, you know, that's on the Dreamcast." And so, you know, if you want to play it, you can get it on Steam. I, I would, uh, I would say that unlike unlike the last game, the Dreamcast version pretty much impossible to play. Yes, uh, unless you know Japanese. I mean, it's it's just it's literally um, there is there are some guides available. There was a good guide on on um, one of the sites on the internet. It was a good, was a good guide on there, but it, I mean, it's properly difficult to get into it's kind of one of those games where i think some of the games we're discussing today are, are games that are fully playable this is one game which is definitely not playable unless you are really really patient yeah or can speak so japanese def definitely get the uh the the steam version i think because <laughs> it, it looks nicer they added voice acting and i think there's all these extra bits so that's probably the one to go for instead of sitting in a trying to translate the dreamcast version you know it's a really interesting game there's a bit of a cult following that's sort of appeared around it um you know i think it's one of those games that's just naturally interesting you know if you give it a try mm -hmm. you know you're gonna play it you're gonna keep progressing through it and unfortunately with this game you 
you're probably going to end up failing the first time because it's one of those things where you have to really learn the ins and outs and the intricacies and what yeah. does what um, with these stats. So, yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing. Rob, will you pick this one up? <laughs> I'm get look, you know, like I'm I do love my management stuff. Uh, I'm definitely into football manager. I, I'm also into, you know, you know, you'll find stuff back on the Dreamcast junkyard, you know, quite a lot of sort of Japanese visual no- novels and the dating sim. I remember writing up about key to E white illumination. Yep. Um because again, exactly what you guys have said, you know, like there is this perception in the West that all the, all those sort of games, the visual novels, the dating sims, these sort of management sims, they're all a bit dodgy, but actually a hell of a lot of them aren't. They're just very normal. Yeah. Um, and it, it is a sort of a different culture. So phew, I think it's more the time aspect for me that, that is probably why <laughs> I won't end up picking this one up. But it sounds interesting. It does. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, anyway, moving on. Rob, um, your first pick, uh, the one I'm coming to first is uh, it looked quite interesting to me uh, when i watched the video for it and that is a game called rainbow cotton um so what turned you on to this game rob okay so the thing that turned me on to rainbow cotton is the fact that i'd had previous with the cotton mm-hmm. franchise or series um on the neo geo pocket and the saturn um the various games and if anyone doesn't know sort of the rainbow um the cotton sorry the cotton series it's basically a side scrolling shooter but very cutesy um you know um you basically play again this quite you know i don't know if you call a schoolgirl age witch but she's like a young witch and it's you know those games the games that i played before i got you know sent on to rainbow cotton they were side scrolling shooters you know left to right loads of color loads of sort of like cute kawaii stuff um really sort of visually and audibly really sort of exciting um but rainbow cotton's completely different in many regards because it's not a side-scrolling shooter it's like a space harrier sort of fly into the screen sort of shooter um it retains all the sort of the cutesiness um and one of the reasons that i first um got drawn to it because ju- just how well it runs on the dreamcast like i'm a huge like bore when it comes around to like frame rates like i i just i don't i don't really care so much about resolutions although that you know they're very nice to have and it's one of the reasons why i like the dreamcast and i think i said this on the last pod so many of the sony dreamcast games run incredibly well and and this one is is one of them it's it's i don't know what the the frame rate is but it's it's buttery smooth basically for 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 everything in the game um but i chose this one because I, i think it's a game where you know we're talking about Certain games, can, you know, would be really difficult to bring out of Japan, maybe because of the language barrier or because of this cult, the, the culture barrier that we've just been discussing. And others, a bit like this one, like you can literally bang it in the system and you don't need to know loads of Japanese. And it's very arcadey, like it's really just like an arcade flying to the screen shooter. Yep. Um, so for me, it just felt like. I think it's a missed opportunity in, 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 in two senses. Like one, I think it was a missed opportunity because for me, it, in my mind, at least it communicated everything that I thought the dreamcast was. And I thought it would do well in the West. You know, it's bright, colorful, ran well, like visually very spectacular, specifically if you've got like the VGA, you know, set up. Um, and also I thought it's a bit of a missed opportunity because as anyone who's played it will will no doubt attest to the there are numerous issues you know which sort of really hamper it from being like a really like you know if, if these issues didn't exist then it would be like one of the first games that i would i would recommend someone to play on the dreamcast but but with them then it's not it's sort of like a flawed game and the, the biggest one of those without being about the bush is the control mecha- control mechanism i mean i don't know if any of you guys have played it maybe maybe yeah. you want to sort of weigh in here yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure uh, you're, you're going to a far more eloquent uh, description than I will. But yeah, the, the controls and the, the fact that you, you you get in the way of your own targeting uh, system is slightly annoying in the game. Yeah, absolutely. Like, 
I, I, how can I describe it? So you've got your you, you've got your analog stick and you're flying into the screen. And how the game works is like there's literally there's just like color and noise and like madness going on all over the place. And it's really hard. It's like almost like a bullet hell schmup from back in the day where it was really hard to keep actually what was going on. What are your bullets? What are the bullets coming at you? There's a billion enemies on screen. And it's not quite so frenetic, but just like there's so much going on. And every time you move this, so you've got your analog stick and you're moving it. And obviously when you move, um, the cotton on the broomstick moves. But when you release the stick, instead of staying where you were and aimed where you were, it auto centers and brings you back to the middle of the screen. So in order to shoot off or move in any direction, you've got to constantly have the thumbstick under pressure. And when there's a billion different enemies on screen, and you, uh, and or, or when you're trying to dodge obstacles, because that's another thing that can that can uh, kill you, it's really, really frustrating, really frustrating. It, honestly, if they just nailed that control scheme, I think even if they just had it so it didn't auto center, um, it would be infinitely better. Um, but as it is, yeah, you've got to really wrestle with the control scheme to sort of get anything out of it. Um, so yeah, I think it could have done well. I think it could have done well if it was one a better game, and two <laughs> if they'd actually brought it over. Because there's nothing really to stop them bringing it over. There's no barrier. Mm. Yeah, um, it's a really uh, nice looking game, and yeah. actually, I mean, I I, I want to say maybe because the character look is an anime character. You know, that's like the thing I can think of. But really, the the colors, the the sort of magic theme. It's not that far off Nights into Dreams, really. Mm. Like, yeah, that's true. Like, if you look at the boss that's like this giant frog, you know, I could see mm. knights fighting against something like that. Yeah. You know, I, I could, yeah. I, mean, I, don't, I, could have I don't think any of the Cotton games got ported, did they? Um, I'm trying to think if any yeah. of the Cotton games got ported at all, which that's is really weird because they're quite, yeah. you know, they're sort of quite appealing games to the West, I think, and the sort of Halloween y themes to it. Um, I, I remember playing this game first time. I've, I've always sort of wanted to play Panorama Cotton on the Mega Drive, um, and obviously this is sort of the sequel. As not, not it's not really a sequel, but sort of the next 3D uh, Cotton game. And um, I played the Panorama Cotton using the uh, Mega Everdrive many years ago. And I played this, and I, I was really disappointed. As Rob has, has, uh, has described perfectly, it's basically one of the most disappointing moments when you get this game it looks amazing it looks stunningly fast it's smooth it looks really, really colorful and then you control it and it's just like ah that's not right and it's just it just doesn't feel right at all which is really really disappointing because it's um it's a really interesting game to look at yeah I hadn't thought of that. I, I, I well I, I agree with you Mike because you're agreeing with me. Um <laughs> but I I think I also I hadn't thought of that knight's sort of comparison, but I would I would say like that knight's aesthetic. This game is like like Panzer Dragoon, but with a knight's mm-hmm. aesthetic thrown all over it, but with an True. awful control scheme. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, so I, I'm going to ask the question here because I, I I looked at the video of this game and it and it did it looked very appealing. The control scheme issues you brought up kind of put me off slightly, but mm. you know it might be a game that I wouldn't mind picking up at some point. I'm sure some of the listeners would. Um, do do we know if this is one of the cheaper options? No, no, no it's not. No, no, no. Oh. <laughs> okay. I don't think any cotton game is, is no. cheap. You're right, absolutely. Like no yeah. cotton game, and I know that very well. Even the Neo Geo Pocket title, which yes. you know is is like visually nowhere near basically any of the other cotton games. Still, we are talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds. I think, oh. I think it is the cheapest cotton game. Um, right. I'm, tr- I'm trying to think. Panorama Cotton's few hundred pounds, I think. Um, I think the Neo Geo Pocket Color is probably five hundred at the current time. It's really expensive, and the Saturn games. So there's two in it. The Saturn uh, Cotton Two and, and Boomerang, is it? Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I think they're both hundred and fifty to two hundred. Last time I checked, and and the prices on Dreamcast games have gone up so much this year. I'm losing track myself. I think Rainbow Cotton goes for about hundred to hundred and fifty at the current time. Ouch. So, so you're gonna to have to really want to play that game. Yeah, uh, to buy that's it. it. <laughs> it's so tough. Well, that or just rip it and uh, you know, exactly, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> just yeah, play it yourself. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. what I did with the uh, the Neo Geo one. I I just I've got I recently picked up the Neo Geo Pocket Color SD. Oh yes. Uh, oh yeah. Cart, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I I just was playing it on that, and I I was playing it, and I thought this is fun, but I would not pay all that money for it. Exactly. I'm really glad that I just 
put it on this SD card reader. Yeah, I don't want to get back into it. another conversation about um, kind of keeping um, physical games alive and, pre- and preservation and stuff. But it's, yeah, when you get to that kind of situation where you're having to pay hundreds of pounds just to play a game that looks interesting, it's uh, yeah. definitely off-putting. And that's why we have things like GDMU, I suppose. So, uh there you go. That's one way to play it. Um, and uh, if you can get past the control scheme by the sounds of it, it, it sounds like it might be OK. All right. Let's move on then to uh, one of my picks, um, which is uh, I mean, I mentioned basically my choice is because I don't have a huge amount of um, knowledge or experience with Japanese games. So my picks are basically coming down to ones that I really like the look of or ones that I've briefly played and want to, and want to play more of but can't because I can't speak Japanese. So this one is one that I've looked at and would really like to play but I just haven't haven't had the chance yet and that is El Dorado Gate 1 to 7. The whole series counting it as one game. Um cuz it kind of is really. Um but uh, this game as soon as I saw it I think I caught a glimpse of it in a magazine back in the day like I don't, it might have been dcuk it might have been the official dreamcast magazine but one of those magazines had a, a just i think it was like one maybe two images of el dorado gate and it was this cool new rpg that was coming out in japan uh completely 2d um you know it was, it, it was gorgeous art style really nice by capcom great art style and it was going to be a series of games um where you played different characters in each one and the kind of the story would come together um uh, and it was a turn-based battle system. I think it's the old school style of battle as well, where you were facing the enemy rather than it being side on, like in the later 2D RPGs. Um, so it was, yeah, it, but it, it looked phenomenally good for a 2D RPG. It looked like kind of almost the pinnacle in those days of what a 2D RPG could look like because the graphics were just so colorful, bright, vibrant, um, well, well done overall. And I always wanted to play it and I was so gutted that it never came uh, to the west um i think in previous episodes i've talked about wanting to own it and wanting to get the box that c- came with it because that was just such a cool collector's item and i do own the first game um i bought it at i think it was play expo a couple of years back uh, the first game and it's all still wrapped because there's absolutely no point in me taking it out and putting it in because i'd have no idea where to start i'd need to get the guide out and i don't have time for that these days so uh, yeah i i i I guess I understand why this was left in Japan because it is incredibly text heavy, uh, would require a lot of translation and RPGs perhaps were not the thing that the Dreamcast was known for. And certainly, um, you know, they weren't as popular here in uh, the UK, especially and and just the West in general. So I get get it, but I'd I'd have liked to see it. I suppose it's also 2D as well, whereas... um... At the time, we were pushing towards, you know, Final Fantasy. And, I mean, the RPGs on the Dreamcast, you got Grandia, uh, you got Grandia yeah, 2, Skies. sorry, Skies, you know, mm-hmm. they're big 3D RPGs. Yeah. Um, and also, the, I, I mean, I don't even know how well it, it sold in Japan, but the, 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 the sort of box set concept was, I mean, to be honest, it's probably a weird concept now to to sell yeah. a game in seven parts i don't yeah, yeah. and obviously with the dreamcast maybe not being as picked up in the west as it was in japan maybe you know they didn't think it was worth bringing it over because people may not have taken the chance on it mm. i think i think japanese had these kind of serial release uh, mm. a fair bit didn't they uh, yeah. i know that obviously since then we obviously telltale games and stuff have, have brought out um, several part games that, that's worked pretty well but i think it, i think if it had been released i think i have a, a vague memory i'm reading in some, one of the magazines possibly dc uk possibly dreamcast monthly um saying that there was going to be a, a compilation of all the games coming out so mm-hmm. whether that was ever on the cards realistically um you know sort of a I, I don't imagine each uh, each game fills the entire disc i can't imagine yeah. it would do so it'd probably be like a three four disc collection mm-hmm. um that would have been quite interesting i think that would have gone down relatively well but as as lewis said i mean 2d gaming at this point you know some of the classics that we talk about now and, and go for hundreds and hundreds of pounds actually were, were torn apart in reviews at the time mm. yeah it's a shame though because i do agree that the art style on this looks absolutely gorgeous like yeah j- just stunning and i i think like the from everything i can see there looks like so much rpg goodness in there yeah. but it's just you know, launching so late, 2000, you know, as you say, like, times times have moved on, you know. Um, but 
I don't know. I think the most interesting thing is is what you guys have, have just mentioned for me. It, it's that serialization. And Mike, you're right. I mean, like the Japanese definitely do have a, a bigger thing for serializing stuff that, that, that never really caught on over here. Um, maybe a bit more now. I mean, I suppose you're seeing it more now, actually, in terms of like when they have seasons in games, you know, like Fortnite season three or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it does exist, but those physical releases, I mean, like, I'd love, I would love Kevin Keegan style to see what the um, the sales numbers were for those games and how mm-hmm. they, I'm presuming they tailed off. But if there's, how many are there? Seven in yeah. the set? Yeah. And they've been and they've been released every couple of months. Yes, two months. What? Yeah. Every two months. What is it? A, well, what is it? That'd be like forty think months. It were, yeah, it was a lower. It was lower amount. It wasn't a full amount either. I think I remember rightly. It was. I, I don't know what the what the yen was at the time, but I think it was sort of midway between budget, budget, and full price. As I've said in the podcast before, I played through the first three, or three or four um, volumes of this game using the guide. The guides available are fantastic. Um, the online guides are really detailed. They're really, really useful, and it gives you enough freedom to still explore the games. They are definitely worth it. But yeah, I think it's one of those series of games where the prices are going up as well. So the later in the volumes you get, the more expensive they are. The mm-hmm. entire box set with the box, you know, you're looking at three, four hundred pounds at the current time in the UK, which is is a lot of money to basically print out with a guide from the internet and, and look at it whilst you're playing the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's another one that GDMU is good for if you really want to crack through it, I suppose. Yep. But um, I mean, it's I mean, knowing that in a magazine somewhere it was suggested that the West might have got a compilation of the seven titles in some form. It, 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 it's these kind of things that make me really wish that the Dreamcast had had like the extra year or two to yeah, get these games absolutely. over here because so, you know if, if if sega had said fine we're, we're going to discontinue but you know we're going to support the console for the rest you know for the, for the end of its life give it give it a good five years let it uh, let it kind of simmer down and then leave it at that i understand why they didn't do that because money you know um <laughs> yeah. but the, but also you know it, people miss out it's like it's almost like the today's equivalent is netflix cancelling a show two seasons in without giving it a proper ending and yeah, yeah. sega did that to yeah, us yeah. with the dreamcast and it and think, it sucks i think the thing as well is the game is, is a capcom game um, yeah. and if i remember rightly capcom at the time had a deal with uh with Virgin, possibly with Ados, I'm not quite sure who they had a deal with at the time. Um, but I think this kind of game would have been hard to sell if to a, to a publisher they were working with in, in the Europe, who were or in the West, who were sort of used to Capcom bringing out sort of, uh, especially on Dreamcast, they were, you know, arcade style games. Try and sell this yeah. seven part RPG series may have been an interesting conversation. Yeah, I could see the. I mean, you know, that uh, I mean, it's a two D game. The, they wouldn't be adverse to that because Capcom has a, has a history of two D games. Street Fighter inc- yeah. sells incredibly well. Yes, it's not a fighting game, but if they could do it as one release, you know, just a one off release, not the seven parts that they did in Japan, yeah. that could have been an easier sell. I mean, I don't know. You know, may, maybe it's to do with the number of discs it would need to be on, and therefore the packaging and the price that they would cost to to make it. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I mean, these days, I mean, if we were to if we were to think of this now this would be a game that you could easily translate and put out there. And a lot of people would play this, I reckon. I mean, yeah. if you if you put the time into translating it, you could put this on Steam, yeah. like they did with Princess Maker. You could put it, you know, on um, on consoles and you know, just game. as a digital download. Yeah, a Switch game. People would buy this and play it because this is the in thing now, isn't it, right? It's, it's going yeah. back to the past, playing 2D games, um, having these, you know, simpler games that, I would say simpler games in terms of graphics, that still deliver that deep experience that people are looking for. You know, that pixel art has exploded. Um, and to have a game of this quality, I think would do really well. So if Capcom yeah. are listening, get somebody to translate this and put it on Switch and PC and it would be worth it. Do it. Cool. Um, <laughs> of course, Capcom <laughs> didn't listen to this, but you know. All right, shall we move on to the next pick then? Mm-hmm. That is, we're going back to Mike, and Mike, your second pick is Tokyo Bus Guide. I can pronounce this one. Tokyo Bus Guide. <laughs> can yes. you explain to us what this is all about? So weirdly, when I was picking games I wanted to feature on this podcast, um, I ended up picking two 45 games, as in developer, 45. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can't really get a game as different from Dicessen than this game. Um, Tokyo Bus Guide is pretty well known. Um, it is a bus simulator, um, Simple, simply put. But it's not a kind of a crazy taxi stroke 18 wheeler type game where you sort of careen down arcade style races. This is a proper sim 
sim game, um, which obviously is very popular in Japan, popular in the UK and Europe and the West now as well, of course. We've seen all these four million bus simulators and train simulators and I don't know, there's thousands of them. Um, I think it's always been a bit of an appeal to, to people to have these kind of weird immersion games. But Tokyo Bus Guide is a really interesting uh, example of this. It's, I think up to that point, the Dreamcast is probably the first 3D console which could give really not not lifelike it's not lifelike but really clean visuals um i mentioned i saw in a, an interview on on youtube a couple of days ago someone mentioned the fact that one of the appeals of dreamcast was that it was the first time that you could see games looking like they were clean they were sharp um, on a console at least so i think um this is one of the, the real uh benefits of this game is that you basically drive around several routes in tokyo um and you basically are in control of the bus so you stop at bus stops um you have to actually stop on the bus stop if you go over the line you get sacked you don't you don't get sacked but you get you get uh you get uh i think you, do, you might get sacked actually um you have to look in the in the in the wing mirrors you have to look in the sort of the, the rear view mirror to make sure that the passengers are all um there and okay and they get on the bus and they pay the money um you have to make sure you're on time to avoid oh. the traffic <laughs> uh you have to go these weird routes i think everything's mapped everything's there to, to to look at but it's quite difficult to do if you're not versed in japanese i imagine it's very similar to if you were an english bus driver and you went to japan and was just thrown to a bus without any sort of comprehension of the language um you know there is quite a lot of of things to learn but it's certainly playable um, and it's just a bit charming, a bit sort of, it's a bit out there for the Dreamcast. There's not really many games like it, apart from from the train simulator, whose name I can never pronounce, so I won't bother. Um, it's not really much like it. So it's a really cool, fun little game, which uh, is probably not the greatest game on the Dreamcast. It's definitely not the greatest game, the greatest game on the Dreamcast, but it's just, it's just so weird. And I think the popularity of those simulator games... Um, in the last few years from from the German developers it is uh, I think it's made this kind of game way up there now and a lot of people are, are aware of it um, I think if this game had come to the West well it wouldn't have come to the West I mean that's a simple answer but if it had come to the West um, I think it actually would have had a pretty big cult following I think it's unfortunately the sort of game which would probably get a budget release on a ps1 that style of game because it's, it's yeah. so out there i think some of the train uh, is it a train whether the japanese train simulator a game in japan called which mm. came to the ps1 i think um but yes yeah, it's, it's just a really fun game and it, it works really well as well one of the great things about this game is that it's it's it works well it feels like you're driving a bus it doesn't feel like you're sort of uh doesn't feel like it's a made for gaming experience it's just basically a proper simulator um, toned down obviously a little bit for, for consoles but just it just plays plays really well and a nice it's a nice change of pace to other games on Dreamcast you know I think I mentioned this on the last podcast as well I love the sort of balls out arcade thrills of the Dreamcast <clears throat> but sometimes you want something a bit more leisurely um, so this is basically sort of like you know the compliment to Shenmue. I was just going to add um, in regards to probably why this didn't come to the west well Obviously, the location of the game, probably, you know, True. they're not familiar locations to people. Um, obviously, the buses run differently in some ways. I mean, not that dissimilar. I mean, <laughs> I went to Kyoto and my dad stood near the, the bus driver, sort mm. of wait, wanting to pay. And the, the, <laughs> the driver like, ushers him like down down the, the bus because the, the rule is that you pay when you get off, which yep. kind of makes more sense, really, because you pay... Yeah you know Personal. where you decide to get off um so yeah there's a little bit everything's a little bit different like the roads probably aren't as familiar to us i, I don't know um but yeah um and obviously like you said mike the simulator games are popular now but i don't know like obviously there was you know flight simulator and all these different games back then yeah. but now it's almost kind of like a, i don't know how to explain it it's kind of like an ironic thing now mm -hmm. like People love playing, um, like, you know, Euro Truck Simulator, but and it's kind of like this sort of nudge, nudge, wink, wink kind of attitude with it. It's like, yeah, like, that's a really yeah, relaxing game, but it's I not think, a game I should like, you know. I get, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. But I think that, I think to an extent, that's probably, that's probably down to people like us, gamers, who sort of think that. I think yeah. uh, my, my wife worked in game for a long time, and, and I, I worked in a shop which sells games as well. And actually, the people who buy them don't, tend to do it on a sort of ironic level it's actually they're actually 
mm. people into really heavily into these games. There was yeah. there is a there is a subset of people, uh, and and me and Rob, I'm sure, are the same in terms of four manager games. You know, we sort of spend hours and hours and hours eclipsing every other game in time we have, literally guiding around imaginary players around imaginary fantasy football worlds that um, that make no sense. I mean, to, to some of you who don't like football, I'm sure that sounds like absolute torture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can I just say one more thing that is sort of testament to why people should check out this game? Um, I, a, a bit like what's just been mentioned, like I've been to Japan multiple times, but one of the times I um, I arrived at Haneda Airport, and um, without I wasn't thinking at all, and went out, and I I was go I decided to take the bus into town, and I got on the bus, and we were it it goes around the various terminals, and then I was it was literally coming out of the Haneda airport sort of like wider complex, the wider road network. And I was looking out the window and I came to this, it stopped at this set of lights and there was this crosswalk and the building here and playing field here and this sort of metal, metal fence down the left-hand side. And suddenly in my mind, I went, it's Tokyo bus guide <laughs> because my mind suddenly went, bam, you've seen this before, even yeah. though at that time I'd never taken the bus out yeah. of Haneda airport before but I'd seen it on Tokyo Bus Guide, and it just shows you that, honestly, I, I think it does. A, I think Mike mentioned it earlier. It does a pretty faithful job, you right. know, in in recreating parts of Tokyo, obviously in a sort of compacted compacted scale. But you know, the clean graphics, and you can see everything. And 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 guess what? You know, certain parts of Tokyo, i.e., round major sort of destinations like the airport haven't been developed since this game was made. So they look exactly the same or very close to, you know, the same today. Mm. That's quite that's quite a funny story. I had a similar thing um, when I went to Alcatraz with my family and my mum goes, oh, where's the courtyard? That's where we should go next. I go, oh, it's this way. And it's because I played it on Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 4. And it's <laughs> like, it's the, on, honestly, other than the quarter pipes and the half pipes and the grind rails, it's pretty faithful the level in Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 4. So, humorously enough, when I when I went to Disneyland Paris, um, I realised that the game Disneyland Adventures is nothing like the park at all, and so we spent lots of hours walking around not knowing where we were going. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like that the antithesis of what you've just said. In May, uh, that's amazing. Um, so yeah, this uh, I, I I can't say this appeals to me, but I think that that kind of genre of game definitely has exploded in recent li- in recent years like you said mike and even i have been caught up with it like um me and my partner bought is it pc builder um oh, yeah. something with a, yeah yeah bought that and uh, we're like putting pcs together putting graphics cards and making sure they worked and it's like you know we the reason people do this is because it's stuff that you can't generally do in real life like you can build a pc yeah. sure but you can't just continually build loads yeah. and loads of upscale pcs because it costs money you can't yeah. just drive a bus in tokyo because you haven't learned how to drive a bus you know you can't go taking truckloads of stuff anywhere because you've not had your truck license i mean most recently me and tom have both been playing snow runner which is yes, you know yeah a fantastic simulation game you know completely properly simulating um trucks and pickups and the the physics of the mud and the snow is it's brilliant a few years ago like like you mentioned people would have probably kind of laughed at that and said why are you doing that you know i think that's because for a while wasn't it games became this sort of um it, games went back to being games if you know what i mean in terms yeah. of it was it was more about the the gameplay only um mm. you know it was about sort of you know online multiplayer and and that sort of the, the the it didn't matter what the game was set almost it was the, the experience was that part of it i think people realized actually not everyone wants to have multiplayer games all the time not everyone wants to do this sort of um continuous sort of competitive gameplay they just want sometimes just to sit back and have a nice casual um game of something which is based on real life but something you'll never do um you know like football margin like riding the bus around tokyo like mm. I don't know, driving a tank through through an orphanage, whatever, it's that sort of thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's hope that nobody actually in real life drives a tank through an orphanage. That would be uh, not good. Um, not again, anyway. <laughs> no, not again. <laughs> no. Um, all right, Mike, <laughs> let's leave it at that. <laughs> We won't go into uh, to when you've done that. No, I might like speak about it. It's fine. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> you've served your time. Mm. Uh, we'll leave it at that. Um, next up is Lewis again, and uh, a bit of a, a bit of a spooky game, I, I think, from what I can gather. Uh, this is Despira. Is that right? Or Despiria? Sorry. Despiria. Yeah. 
Despiria. Um, I don't know if spooky is the way to describe Despiria. It's mm. it's kind of it. You know, spooky. I imagine you know sp- you know skeletons dancing around happily, whereas this is not that. <laughs> this is <laughs> this is a weird weird game. Um, one of only two Atlas games to be released, but uh, I believe the other is Mac and X, which we obviously got in the West. But we never got Desperia, and I think anyone who's listening to this who does, does not know this game, just look up some gameplay footage and you'll confirm pretty much immediately why we never got this in the West. So it's an RPG with adventure style elements. Um, so when we're talking RPG, we're not playing it safe with a a sort of a typical fantasy rpg uh, story like final fantasy or grandia 2 Um, this is a post-apocalyptic cyberpunk horror thing um, which takes place in 2070 world war 3 has happened and you work for this organization that's sort of infiltrating uh, an evil organization called church and the main character allure or on one of her missions she uh, is in a tr- on a train the, the train crashes and she's in this dark dingy underground tunnel may system so um that's basically where the game takes place in this like ho- sort of really claustrophobic maze underground it gets compared a lot to shin megami tensei um which of if you know persona that's a, a big series from atlas instead of summoning demons in this game you use monsters in allure's mind and you basically fight enemies in these like weird psychedelic psychic mind battles and she can (laughs) this is um pretty gross but yeah she she equips abilities by snorting like horrible parasite worms up her nose which like you know if you saw that in a in a western game people would just be like what is this um but yeah the adventure side of it reminds me very much of something like d or Um, There's another game on the Saturn called Tariko. Um, This first person view, you're moving from one static screen to another. um, Mm -hmm. And then on each screen, there's like different things you can interact with. The reason it reminds me of these games is a lot of them haven't aged very well in the sort of 3D graphics department. But I think that's what makes this game so creepy now is... You, you, you know kind of like the, the 3D um, renders that maybe you see in the first Silent Hill. If you look at the manual of Silent Hill, these characters, they look very sort of anemic and creepy nowadays. Yeah. Like back then, probably they looked really good. But now that kind of 3D render style has aged quite poorly. And, mm. you know, I mentioned a game like Tariko on the Saturn. That game doesn't look that good now because it's just an adventure game. And all the characters look really strange and it makes the game kind of creepy. But in the case of Desperia being a horror game, it just amps it up to another level. Like everything just look, everyone just looks really weird. And yeah, I love, I love the way the graphical style is used and actually might have been a little bit, it was a little bit dated even on the Dreamcast, but I I genuinely think they, they did it for kind of a, a stylistic reason. Um, Okay. So yeah, I mean, if you if you look up footage of this game, you, you're going to see a lot of grotesque imagery, um, sort of almost verging on like body horror in some cases, um, and it's definitely that kind of Japanese horror that people in the West find really weird and unsettling and and very uh, alien. So yeah. yeah, that's really why it, this is a good horror game. Um, but unfortunately, it's never been brought over to the West, which is a real shame because right. I think it could have a real cult following now if, if they brought it over. I mean, if you look at it now as well, I mean, I mean I've mean, i only seen videos of it, but not only is it very Atlas in the way that they do it, like you say, the, 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 the powers used by snorting those things that you know as well, Persona, you use your powers by shooting yourself in the head. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. That it's, it, it's oh, something yeah. that Atlas are very known for doing these very bizarre things and people like that now but not just that and i don't know if i'm wrong in in this assumption not assumption but this take on it but when i looked at the footage of it you were kind of doing the static screens and looking for things on the screens to highlight and interact with it reminds me very much of those hidden item games that are extremely popular on like ipad and stuff like that now mm. we have to try and find something within the environment or solve puzzles and stuff mm. so it feels like that in that in itself as well as well as the kind of people now getting the atlas um 
style more would it would probably work quite well but the only thing holding it back i guess is it's quite heavily uh japanese text based right yeah yeah, yeah. also uh, it's batshit crazy right yeah. okay <laughs> i mean you know very strange <laughs> I think I agree with just what was said, though. Like, I think people are game for that. Like, there's yeah. a reason why Persona 3 is my favorite Persona game. I mean, like, I can never get that image of Yukari at the beginning of the game, literally in the opening cinematic, mm. holding the gun against her head. Um, like, I think Atlas has made a name for itself in terms of gamers because it's buckets of style and edge, you yeah. know, and from in everything, from the visuals to the music to sort of the themes to the you know like as you said like i had not heard of this i had not heard of this game but yeah like the psychic mind battles i mean it's very persona um so i agree entirely i think i think there'd be loads of people game to to play this if they could today i think the game is worth pointing out that uh, dc collector who runs a fantastic blog uh, and is a is a, uh, a friend of the Dreamcast Junkyard. Um, it's his favorite game i believe uh from right from when he voted in the poll um he yeah. loves this game but uh I think one thing's really important, as I touch on what Rob just said and what, what uh, Lewis said, Japanese horror, um, I think, surpassed Western horror in the 1990s um, because they they really, they don't just go for, and this is all genres of horror, and whether it's any, any media of horror, I should say, uh, they don't just go for the sort of the, the slasher type thing or lots of blood for the sake of blood or just, just things that are surface horror. They're very much, e- even on things like Resident Evil, one of the reasons Resident Evil is so, so popular, they, they really touch upon the psychological aspects really, really well. And Desperia, um, even though it was a game which I played and had no idea what was going on at all, um, I, I still felt creeped out by it, which is quite an achievement when you don't understand anything that's going on and yet you're still incredibly creeped out by it. Mm, definitely. It's quite an unusual setting for a, a horror game and RPG as well, like the post-apocalypse, 2070 being underground the, the the yeah like you said the psychic mind battles it's i i've not heard of a game with any of those things <laughs> you know yeah. never mind just one of those things any of those things that it sounds so unique um and and looking at it um i i want to play this game and is, are there guides for this game is this one that you can get a guide for or um there, there are guides but i mean they're not very good um it's, right. it's kind of game which i think i think maybe a guide would maybe not be that useful for in, in some in some ways it's a kind of game which i think the experience would a little bit be dampened a little bit um i don't, I don't know i'd say I, I i played it i played it with a guide mm. i played it with a translation guide to actually more than a guide i just played it with google translate but um i mean it's it's very it, it's it's very out there and i think you would it would be a real struggle uh if you don't know uh, at least a fair knowledge of japanese to get any sort of distance in the game okay interesting and is this is this one of those that's up there in price, or is this one that can be had a bit a bit cheaper? Nice and cheap. Nice. Uh, five to ten pounds, I think. Last Ooh. time I checked. Yeah, nice and cheap. Well then, that's it might all be right. more expensive than that. It might be more expensive. Last, than that. last time I checked, it was like in the sort of sixty. There we 60, go. <laughs> so there we go. Range. That's, that's, oh, that was that's, recently. That's, that's... Just let me change it on my A to Z guide. Oh, yeah, I, uh, the thing is, I, I don't know if that's just I looked at eBay <laughs> and that was what came up, but mm. you know. Um, when I when I bought it, I think I bought it um, about ten years ago. Um, when I first started getting Japanese games, it was one of the games that always came up. It was one of those games that all most uh, there was a lot of there was a few Japanese games every single day on eBay. You'd have up there, Despair would be up there, July would be up there, um, mm-hmm. a couple of the games like that would always be up there. I think people sort of bought them on the premise that it looked really interesting, and then they couldn't play them. Um, but it, for a while, it was sort of ten, fifteen pounds. I think it might have shot up a little bit since then. I may be getting confused price wise with July as well. Um, because for some reason in my mind even though they're completely different games uh, they do get mixed up in my mind sometimes okay fair enough i was gonna say if it was five to ten pounds i could have dealt with that and i maybe could have used the rest of the money to hire like an actual japanese person to just sit and translate as we played um you know or got martin to come over martin could translate for me so you know martin there's an offer there if we can get to if we can get to spiria for about 10 quid fly over and you can translate it for me on the fly okay so that is uh Desperia. awesome next one on the list uh one of rob's again and this one is lol oh, yes. not laugh out loud this is lack of love rob why have you picked this one <sighs> what a game yeah i mean i'm gonna try and you know not like undersell this but yeah. i just i might, might well know and you know he can definitely get stuck in as well because he knows the score with this one um 
Yeah, um, so lack of love. Um, how to start? Man, what a game. Okay, so lack of love. Let's start like fundamentally with what it is. Lack of love is a game where <laughs> the premise is a robot called Halumi is sent on a ship, like a terraform, well, not a terraforming ship, but like a sort of set up an ecosystem sort of ship to the far flung parts of space and within that its mission is basically to sort of create life and to create an ecosystem on these planets i think the idea is that it's then going to be habitable for humans um although i don't think it's explicitly said anywhere even in the manual um and then what happens is you basically then play an organism from its most simple form you're basically i think the first form well, I know the first form is a um, like a cell in an egg, or like a, the tiniest of creatures, sort of like in a pond, like you'd have like the the, the origins of life. And then the, the core, the premise of the game is from that point, you then symbiotically interact with your environment and other organisms to evolve. And each quote unquote level essentially is you playing different forms of this organism and you keep getting bigger and bigger and your form changes. Um, everyone will probably be thinking now of Spore, mm -hmm. um, which came out much later than this, um, five or six years, I think. Yeah. Um, and that's very, is very, very similar premise um, to that, although obviously Spore, Spore had some different mechanics. Why this is so interesting is... This was made by Love De Lick, Kenichi Nichi, um, who along with his his team there, um, which includes oh um Ryuchi Sakamoto, yes, the um the great sort of like musician. Um he he was fundamentally like a part of this and he he does the soundtrack for it. Um and I, I read an interview that really actually the concept of the game was came from him. Um But the beauty of the game is that despite it being a Japanese exclusive and despite it sounding like it should be very complicated, actually there's no language at all in the game. <clears throat> there's no written text like, yes, there's a manual and there are brief, I, I will stress brief Japanese instructions as to what the game is, what different things do, but it's very, very sparse. Everything, you know, everything is very sort of, uh, sort of uh, cut down in that respect it's basically sort of it's all about the experience that you go and do so there's so there's some basic commands um but the the main goal is essentially to stay alive and mm. to evolve but crucially to do that you, the game basically it doesn't it doesn't push you all the time but there's a really positive message in this game because to actually evolve and to quote unquote beat the game i don't even like using the word beat because this is not a game you beat you experience it um you have to work with other organisms it's a really positive message in most circumstances you help them out and you can do that in various ways you know like if it's like protecting them it's showing them how to get food access food um where water is these sort of basic things i mean as an organism specifically when you get some of the the sort of the more evolved creatures yes you can eat other creatures if necessary because you there are mechanics in the game like there are like health mechanics um and you do have to do basic things like resting, urinating, you know, like this is built into the game. It's about cycles. It's basically each level you're managing your cycles as this creature. You're trying to stay alive. And to do that, you're trying to create symbiotic, symbiotic bonds with other creatures. Um, and the soundtrack is is just sort of like it's sort of electronica slash classical. Um it's a fantastic soundtrack. The soundtrack is available separately as well. It's something that I do listen to, you know, background normally while I'm working. It's sort of really relaxful, but it's also sort of like got a sort of an alien quality to it. It's very moody. It sort of sort of tra translates, you know, the sort of the how, you know, it's almost like a um, I don't know how to describe it. like the organism itself. It's like the miracle of life. You know what I mean? Like how hard it is for anything to to survive 
and to live, you know, and, and, and I, I can't speak more highly of it. I mean, I've probably not done a good job here in, in describing it, but yeah, I picked this one because my God, this should have come out of Japan. Yeah. Um, mm. and, and the problem is that everyone knows what the problem is. This isn't, this isn't, doesn't fit into any genre. It's not, you know, white men with guns. It's not even, you know, for the Japanese taste, it's not even like Schmarp or a versus fighter. It doesn't fall into any of these bankable, you know, money making, easy sell um types of games. And um it was just incredibly experimental. Um a really experimental game. For me as well, again, this is something I've mentioned before, like the Dreamcast, and we're gonna see that with 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 the the title coming after this one. Um so much um creativity on show and specifically towards the end with the yeah. dreamcast and this game is one of the the most unique titles i've ever played on any console or on any pc at any time um oh, yeah. and i can't yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna be quiet now mike please <laughs> please please get stuck in i think um i think you've summed up pretty much perfectly um it is really difficult to describe the game isn't it because it's up there with res and cosmic smash for me as being a game which is so minimalist um, so, so without language, so it, it transcends borders, it transcends language. Um, it really is, uh, it's a phenomenal game. It's, it's up there in my, in my three best Dreamcast games. Wow. It's just a really, it's a really simple, um, a really simple concept. Um, it is similar to Spore in terms of its, you know, the, the story of evolution, but it's weird really, because the Dreamcast has, a couple of different games like that. We have we have uh, Element, and we have um, uh, another game which I can't remember the name of. Seventh Cross Evolution, um, which are both sort of similar sort of things. But Lack of Love is just so different. It's a really soothing game. It's uh, to me there are elements where it's not soothing, but it's a really soothing, laid back experience, and it's just. Um, I always describe it as being the, the 2001 Space Odyssey compared to the Star Wars <laughs> of other games. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's not going to appeal to everybody. Not everyone's going to get it. But it's it's as an actual technical experience, as an actual gaming idea, It's I think it's probably one of the two or three games I've ever played in, in what, 30 years that have really just completely... <sighs> completely changed my expectations of what a game could be. Um, yeah. Shenmue, funnily enough, was another game which did that for me in terms of the open world. But it's it's different than that. It's just it's just so minimalist. It's it's basically... Uh, it's not minimalist in terms of graphical design necessarily. It's not, I'm not talking about the Res Cosmic Smash style minimalism. I mean minimalism as in there's there's no instructions. There is nothing... You know, it's not a case where you have tutorial. It's not a case where you have to, you know sort of mission goals. It is very, very... Um, you, you really do experience the life of what this creature goes through mm-hmm. um and it's it's a really weird experience it, it is it is possibly the hardest game to describe ever um i do feel for rob having to describe it because it is a really <laughs> difficult game and the music as well so i'm not usually into this sort of <clears throat> this sort of style of music necessarily i have the same i have the standalone soundtrack as well and it is my my by far and away my most played soundtrack on dreamcast um, it is just absolutely uh, everything about it is just absolutely stunning, um, mm. and I think uh, I, I think it's a game which everyone should play. I think the Dreamcast Junkyards article, if I remember rightly, was actually number one for quite a while. If you search for Dreamcast uh, Lack of Love, I believe our, our article was actually top. I'm not sure who wrote that article, whether it was Tom or Rob. It was me. Uh, it was you. I yeah. thought it was Rob. I thought it was Rob. And uh, yeah, it, it was it was the most um, it was the big the, the first search result. So. Hopefully, quite a few people have, have uh, discovered this game due to the Dreamcast Junkyard, uh, which would be fantastic because it is a game which um, truly deserves its, its position. I, one one thing I will say is that um, on the Dreamcast Junkyard top 200 polls, this game got mentioned in the last two polls. It, it, it ranked 93rd and 113th. Mm-hmm. Um, it is not a 93rd or 113th ranked game. Uh, it really is a top 10 Dreamcast game, um, but everyone needs to play it. It's a game which I don't I don't care how you play it. Just, just literally burn a copy from the internet doesn't matter yeah. um and and play it because it is really it is it is it's up there with shenmue in terms of how 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 completely um uh, intriguing how in how in, and experimental a game is and how different a game can be to what you're used to 
I just want to add, um, you know, this this company who developed it, um, I think they were just really ahead of their time. Uh, Lo- Love Delic, they called Love Delic. Yeah. Um, just to sort of add on the end here is, uh, you know, the, there could be even a possibility that we'd see a lack of love ported to newer systems. Um, this company developed a, a game on the PS1 called Moon, which has ha- had a similar cult following. It's like this game where you go around uh, picking up after an RPG hero that just slaughters all these monsters and you bring them back to life. It's like bonkers. It's like an anti game you know mm. that actually recently after since 1997 staying exclusively in japan they actually localized it and brought it out so you know lol would be even easier to bring to modern systems and sort of revitalize it and, and give it that attention it, it deserves and i think the gamers of now would probably appreciate it actually mm. Yeah, it sounds like it. I mean, I was thinking throughout, and you said it, Rob, that a lot of people probably think it sounds like Spore. And from what I've seen of it and what you've described, it does sound a bit like that. And considering Spore came later, I wonder if they actually played this game and took any inspiration from it when they made Spore. Yeah. It'd be interesting if they did. But I think um, what's interesting just to very quick note, though, is the mm-hmm. fact that where Spore, as you got further on in Spore, I found the game to be kind of a little bit tedious. It sort of got mm-hmm. into sort of real time strategy elements and stuff, and it just it didn't work after a while. Lack of love is almost like what Spore would have been if Spore had just stuck to its really cool idea. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. It, it's, again, it sounds like one that I need to pick up. It sounds like one that everybody needs to pick up. Um, but is this is this another one that's high in price, or are we looking at not too much for this one if you wanted to buy it physically? Um, I believe, and I'm sure I'm probably wrong again, but I'm, I, I probably, it's probably touching £1,900 at the current time. Oof, okay. Okay. Interesting. Um but yeah, like you said, it sounds like one that people need to play. So however you however you play it, just play it. Yeah. Yeah. So awesome. All right, the last game that's on our list, um, which is my pick, uh, is one that I have I have played this game because it was so reliant on the Japanese language. There's only so much I could play, and I do find it difficult to use guides, and I find it breaks the immersion for a lot of games. This one being one of them, I think for me, um, this is Sega Gaga which I think, Rob, you alluded to as uh, just before yes. as being such a creative uh, yes. title. Um, it is, <clears throat> excuse me, it is one of the games that I saw at the time, you know, the, the British gaming press, the DCUKs of the world, etc., showed this game towards the end of the Dreamcast cycle when everything was kind of, all hope was lost. We were all going to lose the Dreamcast and we we're going to have to go on to other things because yep. Sega was leaving the market. And here was this weird game in Japan that was coming out. It was obviously never going to come out here. It just wasn't going to happen. But this was a Sega game taking the piss out of Sega, um, essentially. They were they were laughing at themselves. They were They were taking the mickey out of themselves. But also... On you know on the flip side of that they were it was a love letter to mm. what Sega was and and, yeah. and where it was at the time, um I, I, you know as a console manufacturer as a game producer it, it, you know it was it, it's just this incredibly odd thing for them to have done uh, I mean the Dreamcast era for Sega was probably pro- possibly a lot of people argue over which, which era was Sega's most creative I I feel it was Dreamcast because of you know the, the the breadth and the depth of the different types of games that we got and um you know the the singular vision that they had with the blue sky aesthetic that actually came through so yeah. much of it and then you've got sega gaga which is almost like was a rounding out of of, of yeah. sega yeah. in general this this was their their swan song really as a console manufacturer they released this game which is um a turn-based rpg slash management sim um, which has you take the role of this person who comes in to work for Sega and ends up taking over and coming up coming up with different game ideas. Um, and I think you end up having to go into the computer, right, to fight different versions of characters from Sega games in order to get them to be able to make games with them. I didn't quite get some of the story yeah, aspects sort of, of it, yeah. but yeah. I, I kind of picked up little bits. But this is why I had issue with it, because there's so much story going on there, and I felt like I was missing a trick with it. Um, and I I see why it didn't come to the West, but also I really wish it had done. I mean, can anybody explain it a little bit better than I than I can? Well, I'll have a, I'll have a crack. I mean, I'm not, I'm not an expert. I mean, my, my, you, you definitely go after me as well. But, like, 
yeah the that's the, the fundamental you, you play a, a guy actually called sega you know like right. that that's the one thing i'd say like the game is just like you mentioned it it's so like um it's a love letter but it also rips the rips the piss out of like sega and related properties like mercilessly yep. Yep. um and you, basically you're sort of like part of you're a recruit you're recruited as part of like the um i don't know if it's actually called the sega gaga program but basically you're recruited to come in and save sega because there's the evil um the evil rival companies basically like they've got you know like they're dominating and and, and sega's you know backs against the wall which it was in real life like it's incredible really when you think about it um and then yeah it's a mixture of like management where you've got to manage studios and produce games while also as you mentioned like fight characters i think you know um, various different characters both from sort of sega characters as well as just sort of like generic japanese sort of um yeah. otaku type type baddies mm-hmm. um and it's a mixture of those two things i think it, uh, it gets more management as you go on but that it's making it sound really dull everyone said management alone i've just realized <laughs> but, like it's not mike take over and say why it's not dull <laughs> why it's not dull so it, it is ultimately a management an rpg game but um some of the reasons it's not dull so you have loads of of really amazingly hilarious references to sega characters um the infamous alex kidd reference um working in a, in a shop um as a you know bedraggled sort of character forgotten by sega is is fantastic um they've got a, a shmup in there I, I know some people don't like the word shmup but there's a shoot up in there um which is i think done by the same people who made thunder force um and it's it's absolutely fantastic you fight against each boss or each of the the bosses you fight is basically uh different sega consoles um there are loads of little mini games one involves having to stack dreamcast console boxes up um there are just loads of of really amazingly cool references throughout the the entire game that you you can collect previous sega releases and put them onto like a sort of a, a gallery shelf that you have as you collect them um there's loads of references to sony nintendo in sort of you know tongue-in-cheek references um it, it's just i i played through the entire game with a guide um i know that obviously there's a guide still ongoing for a, a full video playthrough done by uh by ross one of the fellow mm-hmm. junkyard members but um, it is playable with a guide um you do obviously miss out a little bit but all of the references you understand and to be honest with you it's, it's definitely worth playing it is a game which i would 100 percent say if you are a sega fan to play through there's never been a game yeah. I think maybe with the exception of Sonic Racing Transformed, which really captures Sega fandom. Mm. Um, and it's just sort of, it's, it's, when Sega fandom's at its best, when it's not just about putting pictures about Sonic and Knuckles doing unthinkable things <laughs> on the internet, um, Sega fans are sort of very tongue-in-cheek. They're very sort of aware of their own failings. And this game is, is literally, yeah. it captures it absolutely perfectly. The audio is fantastic. The visuals are, uh, you know, they're not, they're not, pushing the console but they have really good visuals as well and just the entire game is just um it's just fun yeah it's, i i i think you said it you, you know you said it right at the beginning when you said you know like it was like sega's almost like it's backs against the wall i forget who said it but they're saying like this was like the crowning not the crowning glory but the sort of the the, the tip essentially of that creativity yeah. and coming out as it did i mean it's got a, it's one of the last games before the cord is literally pulled it's just so self-deprecating and so knowledge like so I've, I've never known i can't think of another game personally myself specifically on a, on another you know non-sega platform that's so like no. sharp and on it like really cutting at times um and unique again like we're talking about unique experiences like yes obviously you know turn-based combat Yes, you can find it anywhere. Yes, you can find sort of management games. But how it sort of combines these with the mini games Mike, t- Mike talked about and the unique aesthetic and all the jokes and the self-deprecation and the sort of the, the, the almost insider jokes about the video game industry as well. Like, yeah, and Sega fandom and just all rolled together. It's a completely unique proposition. And yeah, it's amazing. My only regret, and this is something that I'm sure Mike doesn't have, uh, I, I said this years ago on one of the, the Dreamcast podcasts, is that I never got my hands on the uh, special edition Sega Gaga box set, which now, I mean, the last time I looked was years ago, but it was it was ludicrously expensive then, so God knows what it's like now. 
it's not actually too bad. Um, the prices oh. of well, I think I think it's actually. <laughs> Excuse me a minute. <laughs> I think it was me and you spoke actually a few years ago about it on the podcast. But um, we said about or possibly in person actually. But uh, we spoke about the fact that I had a, a, a three three um, special editions I wanted since the start of my Dreamcast collecting, which was uh, the DR Jetta Radio, the yeah. Space Channel Five Part Two, and Sega Gaga. And I picked up Sega Gaga one a couple of years ago. Um, I think it's all, you, you can get it. I think my mine cost hundred and five, which obviously oh, okay. is a lot of money. It's a lot of money. But I mean, I mean, I, I spend more than that on on absolute tosh. This game's a fantastic game with a fantastic T-shirt which fits me amazingly enough, um, and some badges which are just amazingly cool. So it is a game which is is just about affordable uh, in terms of limited edition if you want to splurge and have a nice Sega uh, memory. But um, there are cheaper versions of the game available as well. Mm. Is it, how much is the regular, just a normal edition? Is that about fifty-ish? <laughs> It depends what you call a regular edition. Um, ah. So there's a, a dual case version and there's a DVD case version. Um, I think the DVD case version was the one released on the Sega Direct store, and the dual case was the one released in stores. I might be wrong. Um, they sort of they it, it sort of changes quite a lot. I would say probably anywhere between fifty and a hundred pounds. Okay. Um, but I think you know it's it's a game which I, I don't recommend that kind of price for games often. I, I if you can get it for 50 60 pounds it's definitely worth picking up mm. yeah i agree mm. uh lewis have you played this game at all i have unfortunately not but it is right up my street the like like what has been said the sort of self-deprecating sega humor in it is like right up my alley i, I think anyone who's a sega fan just wishes they could could play through this and obviously uh it's one of those ones we've always wanted to see patched you know into english but fingers crossed i just feel it was like again this is my mind i know there's obviously loads of games that come out afterwards but for me it's like you know it's like the final one of the absolute final dreamcast games or just because of the content that it has and how it how it approaches it i see it in my mind as like the final game it's like sort of like saluting as dreamcast sails off into the distance Mm -hmm. so do you know what? We, we've got some, so we had some Twitter suggestions and we will go through them briefly, but I, I'm conscious that, you know, we are we are going on to the longer side of uh, a podcast, so we don't want to take too much more of your time. Maybe, and I don't know if this is something that you guys would be up for, maybe we do a part two of this at some point, because I think there's a lot yeah. more games that we could talk about, to be honest. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah totally. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, what we'll do, but before we briefly go through the Twitter suggestions, which I'm sure Michael will give us a very brief explanation of, if you guys could pick one of the games that we've just spoken about to come out today to be re, uh, re-released and in English, if needs be, on a modern console, only one of them, which one would you pick, Lewis? Sega Gaga. Sega Gaga. <laughs> and, I, and I think that might be quite a few of you's picks. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, what about you? As much as I love Lack of Love, it has to be Sega Gaga. Ah, Rob? And it's Sega Gaga. <laughs> ah, there we go. Me too. So uh, all uh, full house for Sega Gaga. As much as I would want Eldorado Gate, Sega Gaga is is definitely up there. So there we go. Sega Gaga is the pick of today. Uh, so if you haven't played it, it sounds like you really should go out and pick it up. All right, let's go on to the Twitch suggestions. Um, the first one being the Sakura Wars series, specifically three. Mm-hmm. Mike, what's so good about these games? Um, I think the I think Lewis is probably the better person to talk to about oh. Sakura Wars. Um, <laughs> we spoke about it in quite detail in our. Um, visual novel episode 73 uh, did, for the yeah. dream pod yes. but um I, I, lewis is a bigger fan of secure wars than i am so i shall let him uh, take this one yeah um it's basically a tactical rpg mixed with kind of a dating relationship simulator um it's it's very popular um, in well, it was very popular in Japan, as we alluded to on episode 73. We do explain a little bit more about why it's so good on there. Mm. Um, but just to say, you know, if you like something like Fire Emblem or um, Persona, anything like this, which really focuses on the relationships between the characters in like a, a squad, uh, fellow fighters, yeah. then you're gonna you're gonna love sakura wars um unfortunately it's one of those ones that has eluded us um for many many years um you can play the first one on the saturn using an english patch and also there's a really really good revisiting i suppose 
that's come out uh, this year is in April. Um, mm-hmm. They released a sort of a, a reboot of it, which I've been playing. And it's very, very good. So, yeah, um, check out episode 73 if you want to know more. That We definitely go into more detail there. Awesome. Um, another one I think was on episode 73 that was uh, suggested on the on the Twitter. Uh, Boulder Force EXE. Um, what's this one about, Mike? Um, so yeah, so it's not it's not really a visual novel. I think we just we discussed this on seventy three actually. Um, it's sort of a visual novel time management style game mixed with um, two big robots or lots of robots fighting against each other in quite cool sort of top down view um, combat. It's a it's a weird game. It's a game which everyone sort of a lot of people speak very very highly of. Mm. I sort of didn't really get it when I played it. I, I mean, I I understand yeah, it was cool, but not really as good as maybe maybe it's made out to be. I know. Um, uh, Stephen at Dreamcast Hub is a massive fan of this game and has done many videos over the years. Um, he loves the game, and I know lots of other people do as well. So maybe I'm just I'm just missing something a little bit. But to me, it just never really never really gelled. Fair enough. Um, all right, uh, cracking through the other ones we've got. We've got Cool Decept, which is card game. This one looked really interesting to me, but again, the the, the language barrier here. What's this one about? So Cold Decept, uh, Cold Decept Second. Okay. Um, so it's Cold Step 2, um, but I think it's, it's referred to as Cold Step 2nd. Okay. It's based on a Japanese, uh, fantasy, it's a fantasy board game, basically, um, with game cards. So sort of similar to, and I don't really play this kind of game, so I'm going to completely screw this up probably, but it's like similar to sort of Magic the Gathering type mechanics, I think, okay. um, but mixed with a board game more. So one of those sort of board game type games um, rather than a card based game. Um, lots of strategy. It's pretty playable um, if you persevere. I think uh, PC Wizard um, uh, has played this game quite recently, I think, and enjoyed it. But uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I think you have to have knowledge of the game itself, possibly. Right. Um, and again, I might be mixing it up with Magic the Gathering. I'm ahead again now, which just you know, I'm not really into sort of card and board games, so I apologise to anybody. Please don't write any letters of complaint. <laughs> Clearly, just not geeky enough, Mike. Um... No, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> um, next one. I want to pronounce it Frame Grid, but I think I heard somebody pronounce it Frame Grid. How do you pronounce this? Is frame it just Grid. Frame Grid. Frame grid. Yeah. 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 Sounds like an odd frame pronunciation. Grid. Yeah. Um, so this is this is uh, robots, right? So this is mechs. <laughs> robots. Got all robots. robots. That's, it. That's the description you're gonna get. Robots. Is it? Move on to the next game. Um... <laughs> <laughs> robots. Is it? Um, yeah. Very well. Yeah. So um, it's, it's uh, from software. Uh, yeah. So it's from software game. Um, obviously, from software known more for their Dark Souls and Demon Souls and God knows whatever those games are called now. Um, also known for Armored Core. Um, so it's that sort of uh, big mech game set in medieval fantasy sci-fi which obviously makes no sense to anybody but it's uh, it's quite cool to look at um it's completely playable without any knowledge of, of language at all so um i think there is an english translation which does some of the menus does change and there's a couple of stats maybe with with uh, japanese language but it's actually pretty playable without it um it's uh it, it's it's all white right. it's not my sort of game I, but it's all right i presume this one's probably I can imagine has become more popular in recent years. What with Demon Souls and Dark Souls being like so big, you know, and people, a lot of the old From Software games, I think, are getting quite uh, desirable for that reason. Yeah, I think I think so. It's it's still quite cheap. Last time I checked, um, mm-hmm. the English translated version is obviously the way to go if you want to have a fully immersive experience. It's it's a white. I mean, if you like sort of, I suppose if you like virtual on stuff, I, I suppose it's like that again. Not really my sort of game, but um, I enjoyed it. This one's one. It's one v one, isn't it? In little arenas, rather than. I think so. Yeah, Yeah. it's definitely one on one for the battles I've fought. If I'm guessing, it's only one on one. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, Moving on, the last game that we had uh, from Twitter uh, was the Last Golem, and I've not heard of this one. What's what is this one? Last Golem is a fantastic game, Um, uh, and again, referencing people (laughs) who've been on podcast in the past. Um, Aaron is a big fan of this game, I believe, and has written a, um, a write-up on the Drinkers Junkyard in the past, which, again, I think is one of the highest hits you get if you go on Google and search for it, which is, again, good for the Junkyard. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a puzzle game, um, but it's it's a, a sort of, it's odd to call it a puzzle game because it's, it doesn't really describe it as well as it, it should do. It's a 3D sort of world, as it were. Each stage is a sort of 3D world. Basically, it didn't sell many copies at all. Um, it made by one person, I believe, which sort of had some uh, some media attention at the time. And basically, you control a rock golem who must guide a somewhat befuddled king to the exit of each stage by clearing the way. Um, the king will only turn in the next possible direction whenever he hits a wall. 
and it's your job to move these walls around to make his path easier and to allow all walls to be connected to the red wall on each stage at the end of each level. It doesn't sound particularly fun, um, but as Aaron's review of the game gave, uh, gave it, it, it's really quite a cool little game. Weirdly enough, it was a game which you could pick up relatively cheaply for quite a while and then suddenly went through the roof in price. Um, I don't know how much it's worth now, but it's I think last time I saw one, someone tried to sell one for like £165, so ridiculous. Oh. Um, I don't think it's worth that much, but um, it's, a, it's a cool little game. There's a little uh, creator level mode as well, about 100 levels in the game itself. Another one of those kind of weird Japanese puzzlers that probably wouldn't have looked out of place on European shelves, but also would have been quite budget titles that no one would have actually remembered. Mm. Do you know, listening to all of the games so far, all the ones we've talked about, I say so far, this that's all now. That's all the games. We're, we're not going to go through anymore, don't worry. <laughs> um, we've been here long enough. But th- a lot of these sound like games that would do very well now. And we've said that already, but these, yeah. it, it's almost like these games, they were ahead of their time for the Western market. So no wonder they didn't come out then, but maybe now's the time for them. I, I, I think perhaps just over the intervening years between the Dreamcast and now, perhaps Western tastes have changed enough that these are the kind of games that people kind of want to play now. You know, we, we, we see stuff like like Tokyo Bus Guide nowadays that that's, that sells incredibly well. And we see games maybe a bit like uh, Desperia um, that appeal to Western audiences. Um, so maybe these are games if they were to be released on more modern consoles, if we got them ported to Switch, if they were ported to Steam, maybe now they would do well, but perhaps back in the day, uh, they just weren't the kind of games that would do well in the West, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Um, all right, so so we don't go on any longer. Uh, let's, uh, let's just go around and uh, let everybody know where they can find you if they would like to. Rob, where can people find you online? Okay, people can find me on Twitter, and uh, my handle is at rnicholasj, so that's R-N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S-J, rnicholasj on Twitter. And you can also find me at uh, t3.com. Excellent. Uh, Lewis, where can we find you? Uh, You can find me at lewisjfc, Lewis spell L-E-W-I-S. Check me out. Check you out indeed. And Mike, where can we find you? Yep. So um, to anyone who's actually listened to this entire podcast has made it this far, um, I am at um, space underscore turnip on Twitter. I'm also on Dreamcast Picks. Again, I will clarify Dreamcast Picks, P-I-C-S, on Twitter, where I post lots of pictures of my collection um, to absolutely no body liking them because it's what I do. You get a few, get a few likes. Don't I get a honest. few. You get a few. I don't even it's... look, do I? <laughs> <laughs> just post and leave. I just Fine. post. That's what I do, mate. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can find me at oddmint 84 on Twitter. You can also find me uh, at Dreamcast Years if you fancy it. And of course, you can find uh, all of us pretty much at the DC Junkyard if you want to see what the Dreamcast Junkyard is up to on Twitter. You can also go to the website, which is thedreamcastjunkyard.co.uk, where lots of articles by Mike Lewis and Rob can be found uh, to read about all these kind of things. And lots of other people, of course, who've written over the years for the Dreamcast Junkyard, um, and Tom mostly, uh, who can find an article at a moment's notice for any subject. So if you're ever curious, uh, if, you've got, if you've got a question, Tom should be able to find it. We may we may do a quiz one day uh, where we ask Tom to find an article for anything we decide to bring up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, of course, you can uh, find us uh, many other places as well. We're on YouTube. We've got a Facebook group. So come and have a look. Come and interact uh, with us a little bit. And uh, we'll be back again very soon for another episode of Dream Pods. So until th- until then, take care. Bye bye. Please stop this disc now. 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 now.